Since the early 70s, so-called supercomputers have been developed based on high-speed circuit technology and also on architectural innovations. It was shown in this era that one can ob obtain more than one order of magnitude performance improvement of our conventional sequential computers. This is done by taking advantage of certain common characteristics of computational algorithms encountered in application programs. In many large-scale scientific and engineering application programs, such as weather forecasting, fluid dynamics, signal processing, and linear algebra, there are common characteristics in the computations. That is, a significant portion of the computation time is spent on identical arithmetic operations performed on hundreds or thousands of operands, which are usually in the form of multidimensional arrays. This observation has led to architectural innovations such as SIMD parallel computers and also pipelining techniques. This figure depicts the concept of parallel processing, where identical operations can be performed over many operands. This drawing is inspired by the description in the book written by an English meteorologist, Louis Richardson, back in the 1920s. In this book, he hypothetically described the so-called weather theater, where 64,000 human computers perform simultaneous computations under the direction of a conductor. This is the essence of parallel processing. The second concept is pipelining, or in today's commonly used terminology, vector processing. This is more like an assembly line in an automotive factory, as depicted in this illustration. Arithmetic operations, such as floating point addition and multiplication, can be decomposed into several sequential steps. Therefore, by segmenting the arithmetic circuits accordingly, one can keep feeding operands from one end and obtaining the results at the other end at every clock cycle, as if you were completing an arithmetic operation in one clock cycle. Pipelining technique is very effective as far as hardware utilization is concerned because all the logic circuits do useful work at every clock cycle. The modern supercomputer architecture usually incorporates parallelism and pipelining concepts to their full advantage. For example, pipeline arithmetic circuits may be physically replicated to obtain more than one result per clock cycle. Since we cannot expect much more performance improvement out of the raw circuit speed alone anymore, we obviously have to depend more on the parallelism in the future supercomputer design. This figure shows relations among the number of processors, performance of each component processor, and the system performance of the parallel computers. The number of processors is plotted on the x-axis, and the processor performance is plotted on the y-axis. So each diagonal line, which is shown in this graph, corresponds to various combinations of number of processors and the performance of each processor to achieve a certain system performance goal, say 10 gearflops, 100 gearflops, 1 teraflop, and so forth. In a simplified argument, you can realize parallel computers with a certain system performance goal with various combinations of the number of processors and the performance figure of each processor. This overlay indicates where we stand today. This ellipse here corresponds to the performance of scalar or sequential machines such as RISC chips, microprocessor chips, and mainframes. This ellipse here is today's conventional vector supercomputers with shared memory architecture, where the number of processors ranges up to 16 or so, each giving a gigaflop class performance. Therefore, the conventional vector machines are performance-wise in the range of tens of gigaflops. This ellipse here is so-called massively parallel processors, or MPP, which could consist of thousands of relatively low-performance off-the-shelf components to achieve hundreds of gearflops of system performance. 
In this case, the memory will have to be distributed across the processors. It is also possible to fill the gap between those two extreme cases by utilizing hundreds of 1 Gigaflop class component processors, thus achieving hundreds of Gigaflops of system performance. This figure illustrates the two approaches to achieve higher performance. One is from sequential processing to vector processing, then incorporating multiple vector processors. The other approach is from sequential processing to scalar parallelism, then incorporating certain vector processing capabilities on each node. As I showed in the previous figure, there are many ways to achieve the same system performance goals, combination of the number of processors and the performance of each processor. For a given aggregate performance goal and memory size, a parallel system with fewer processors can always provide the following advantages. The first one is more locality in data, which is commonly referred to as volume versus surface effect. Simply put in physics terminology, if two steel balls of different sizes are heated to the same temperature and then cooled down, the larger one can maintain its temperature longer than the smaller one. A good example in computational sciences is solving the partial differential equations using a finite difference approximation. If you have fewer processors in the system, each having a larger size memory, then you can store more grid points in one processor, thus relatively reducing the data exchange among the processors. More discussion will be made on this issue later. Secondly, if you have fewer processors in the system, you obviously have less redundancy in the copies of application programs, which are parallelized. The same thing also applies to the operating system kernels, which reside in each processing element. Thirdly, since the introduction of the first vector supercomputer in the latter half of the 70s, Vector processing technique has been well understood in the community, and there is a sizable amount of vectorized software assets readily available. Therefore, parallel processing based on vector processing is a smooth and straightforward approach. In order to further elaborate the discussion on the volume versus surface effect, particularly in relation to the number of processors, the performance of each processor, and also the size of the processor memory, I have selected an example from the seismic data processing applications in the petroleum industry. It is a simulation of the 3D elastic wave propagation. In this application, the wave propagation through the three-dimensional media is first described in terms of a set of partial differential equations, as shown here. These are velocity components, and sigmas are the components of the stress tensor. Then, simulation is done by using a finite difference approximation to these equations. I have simplified the model to clarify the points which are important in the foregoing discussion. Here's a list of notations to be used. The first group is architectural parameters, such as memory size per processor, in megabytes, data transfer rate per processor in megabytes per second, and the computational capability per processor in megaflops, and the number of processors in the system. The second group is a problem or application dependent parameter, such as the dimension of the grid space n, number of operations per grid point alpha, number of bytes of data to be transferred across the boundary between the processors, data, or the memory requirement for each grid point, gamma. Then we can compute the computational density, eta, which is the ratio of the computation time to the data communication time, or equivalently, we can also compute the efficiency of the system, epsilon, by taking the ratio of the computation time to the total elapsed time. In order to parallelize this kind of three-dimensional wave equation solver, we can partition the data 
and distribute across the processors in several ways. One is what I call the slab geometry, where each processor gets a slice of the 3D domain. In this case, the volume which each processor receives is n cubed over p, while the total area of the surface is 2 times n squared, which is the sum of the surfaces facing the neighboring processing elements. The second geometry is pencil geometry, where each processor receives one column. Again, the volume is the same, n cubed over p, and the surface is a total of four very skinny faces, which is 4 times n squared over square root of p. The third geometry is a cube, where each processor receives one cube cut out of the entire domain. Again, the volume is the same, n cubed over p, and since there are six faces this time, the total area of the surfaces is 6 times n squared over p to the 2 thirds of power. In the following analysis, I will consider all three geometries. Let's calculate the computational density, eta. The total computation time per time step can be obtained by multiplying the number of arithmetic operations per grid point by the number of grid points divided by the aggregate performance. Thus, t sub p is equal to alpha n cubed over the quantity p times g. The data communication time across the processors can be obtained by dividing the area of the surface, which is the number of grid points exposed to the processor boundary, by the data communication speed, c. Therefore, we obtain t sub c as 2 beta n squared over c, or 4 beta n squared over the quantity c times square root of p, or 6 beta n squared over the quantity c times p to the third power, depending on the geometry. Anyway, by evaluating the data communication time for each geometry, we can obtain the computational density, eta, which is defined as a ratio of t sub p and t sub c, the computation time over the communication time. By simple arithmetic, we can obtain these three relations. Another important factor is memory constraint. We cannot solve the problem if it does not fit the memory that is available in the system. So gamma times n cubed should be less than or equal to the memory size m times the number of processor p, that is the total available memory size. From this relation, we can either obtain the maximum size problem for a given processor number p, or the minimum number of processors required to solve a problem with a given size n. For a particular example, which is a three-dimensional elastic wave simulation, alpha, the number of operations per grid point, turned out to be 200. Bell, the number of bytes per grid point which have to be communicated to the neighboring processing element is 72. And there are nine variables, three v's and six sigmas, which have been stored per grid point. Gamma, equivalently, is 36. These figures were obtained by analyzing the actual Fortran program. I have picked up two architectural models for comparison. The first case is a one gigaflop machine with 256 megabytes of data and having 400 megabytes per second data communication capability. The second case depicts a more typical massively parallel platform, specifically 100 megaflops performance, 32 megabyte data, and 10 megabytes per second of data communication rate. By having those system parameters and also the application-related parameters, alpha, beta, and gamma, we can easily calculate the computational density or also the efficiency of computation for various geometries. In this analysis, we fix the problem size n to 1,000. The minimum number of processors can be obtained first, then the computational density or the efficiency of computation 
can be obtained by using equations already described. Within each platform, say case one for example, as we move from the slab geometry to pencil and from pencil to cube, as we reduce the surface area, the computational density increases dramatically from 3.9 to 23.4 to 35.5. The same trend can be seen in case two. Due to a more severe memory constraint, the minimum number of processors is 1125 for case two as compared to 141 for case one. As a result, the computational density for case two drops significantly from case one for each corresponding geometry. And the efficiency is also significantly lower than those for the case one. From this significant difference between those two cases for all three geometries, we can conclude that a system with fewer processors each having large memory size is more efficient than a system with many processors each having relatively low performance and also having smaller size memory. Time is limited to pursue this analysis further, but I would like to point out that the same argument holds for other applications in general when the number of operations per processor increases at the higher order than that for the size of data to be transferred across the processors as n increases. As a matter of fact, the linear equation solver packages such as LAPAC are designed to take advantage of the volume versus surface effect. The VPP500 is a MIMD parallel supercomputer system. The number of processing elements, or PEs for short, can range from 4 to maximum 222. Each processing element is a supercomputer by itself, giving 1.6 gigaflops of vector performance on 64-bit floating point data. There are also up to two control processors, or CPs for short, in this system, which handle job scheduling, resource allocation, and I.O. operations. Both the processing elements and the control processors are connected via a crossbar network. This crossbar network is a conflict-free interconnection network, and unless more than one processing element send the data to the same destination, there's no collision in the data traffic, therefore ensuring very efficient data transfer across the processing elements and the control processors. VPP500 system is connected to a global system processor or GSP via a system storage unit or SSU, a semiconductor storage device with up to 32 gigabytes of capacity. Let me mention the LSI and the packaging technologies which are employed in the VPP500 system. This is a multi-layered ceramic board with 52 layers of conductors. The size is about 10 inches in each dimension. 121 LSI chips are mounted on one board. All the control logic and data path together with cache memory and vector registers for one processing element are packaged in one board. Gallium arsenide by CMOS and ECL LSI technologies are used in the VPP500. This is an actual processing element module which consists of MLG, multi-layered glass ceramic board, the cooling module, and the main storage unit. With eight of the memory array cards like this sample, memory capacity can be up to 256 megabytes on each processing element. This processor module, called the Super Integration Module, or SIM for short, is cooled by water. Here's a water inlet and here's a water outlet. The heat generated by LSIs is taken out by the coolant which flows inside the cooling module. Twelve such processor modules, or SIMs, can be mounted in one cabinet. Now, Let's discuss in more detail the processing element. 
Each processing element consists of a scalar unit, a vector unit, a main storage unit, and a data transfer unit. The scalar unit fetches and decodes all the instructions. It is based on long instruction word architecture, or LIW for short, and up to three instructions can be executed simultaneously in every clock cycle, two of which can be floating point instructions, such as multiplication and addition. The vector instructions, on the other hand, take up the entire instruction word, so only one vector instruction can be executed at a time. The scalar unit is equipped with 32 general purpose registers and 32 floating point registers, and also 64 kilobytes of cache memory, 32 kilobytes of which are for instructions, and the other 32 kilobytes for the data. There's also a direct data path between scalar registers and the vector unit. Next, let's look at the vector unit. The vector unit is based around the vector registers. The total capacity of the vector registers is 128 kilobytes. There are three arithmetic pipeline circuits, that is, multiply, add logical, and divide. Two of the three arithmetic pipeline circuits can operate simultaneously. Both multiply and add logical pipeline circuits produce eight results by replication of hardware every 10 nanosecond clock cycle. Therefore, if the multiply and add instructions are executed simultaneously, there are 16 results per cycle, hence 1.6 gearflops. All the arithmetic is done in 64-bit precision. Data format in arithmetic operations comply with IEEE floating point standard 754. There are also mask registers and a mask pipeline circuit to handle the conditional statements within the do loop. There are two ports to the memory, one for load operation and the other for store operation. These two ports can operate simultaneously. The definition of vector data includes contiguous, constant strided, or indirect addressing. One notable feature of the vector unit is the reconfigurable vector registers. The basic hardware configuration is 256 vector registers, each having 64 elements. But by concatenating such vector registers, fewer but longer vector registers can be configured on the fly, as shown in the diagram. The main storage unit, or MSU, has a capacity of from 128 to 256 megabytes per processing element. The memory is interleaved in 32 ways. There are eight array cars. The memory cycle time is two clocks, which is 20 nanoseconds. The memory of the BPP500 system is physically distributed across the processors, but global data space or global memory can be defined. From the user's point of view, the BPP500 is a hierarchical memory computer system, although there is no physical distinction between local memory and the global memory on each processing element. It is logically defined by the system software. Whenever a global variable is referenced in the Fortran statements of the application programs, the Fortran runtime system translates the multidimensional index set to logical PEID and logical address within that processor element. Such information is transferred to the data transfer unit, which will be described next. The data transfer rate between the local portion of the memory to the vector registers is 6.4 gigabytes per second in each direction. Therefore, the aggregate throughput is 12.8 gigabytes per second. Between global memory and the local memory within the processor, the data transfer rate is 800 megabytes per second. The data transfer rate across the processing elements is 400 megabytes per second, which is the data transfer rate of the crossbar network itself as will be described later. 
the data transfer unit handles the actual data communications across the processors. DTU can operate asynchronously with the scalar unit so that once the data motion is initiated by the scalar unit, the scalar unit can execute the subsequent instructions. The data size for transferring data between processors is variable with the maximum size of 16 megabytes. Various transfer modes are available in the VPP500 system. They are contiguous, constant strided, subarray, and indirect addressing or random gather scale. It should be noted that while the scalar unit can only recognize a local address space within a processing element, DTU, on the other hand, can recognize both the local address space and the global address space. DTU receives such information as logical PEID and logical address within that processor from the Fortran runtime system and converts them to real PEID and real address within that processing element. The crossbar network connects all the processors in the VPP500 system. A data transfer rate is 400 megabytes per second from one processor to another processor. A processor can also receive data simultaneously with the same rate, so the aggregate data transfer rate per processor is actually 800 megabytes per second. Here's a block diagram of the crossbar network. Each square in this diagram corresponds to one MLG module. The bus is four bytes wide, and these blue boxes correspond to 112 by 56-way crossbar network, and the red boxes are the multiplexors. One of the commonly used performance figures for the interconnection network is the bisection bandwidth, which is the worst case aggregate data transfer rate when a parallel system is partitioned into two equal halves. For the crossbar network, which is used in the VPP500 system, the bisection bandwidth is always 400 megabytes per second times the number of processors for any arbitrary partition of the system into two halves. That is, in the true crossbar network, there is no notion of nearest neighbor or next nearest neighbor and so forth. This is a very important feature of the crossbar network because a programmer does not have to worry about the network topology when he designs application algorithms. Furthermore, if the VPP500 is used in the multi-user, multi-job environment, the assignment of the processor elements to a particular parallelized job can be arbitrary. Any idle processors can be allocated to such a job. As is shown in this diagram, a VPP500 system with up to 56 processors can be connected with one set of crossbar modules, which consist of four MLGs. Between 57 and 112, there are two sets required, but there are no high-level interconnection modules. Beyond 112 processors, there are high-level modules called XB2 to complete the full crossbar connections. The crossbar network modules are implemented with BICMOS LSIs. The basic synchronization mechanism of the VPP500 is a barrier synchronization. There is a so-called synchronization register, which is located inside the crossbar network, where each bit corresponds to one processing element. Whenever the program in the processing element reaches the barrier synchronization point, the processor element sends a signal to the synchronization register and sets the bit to 1. There's a circuit which constantly monitors whether all the bits in the registers become 1 for a provided subset of the processing elements. As soon as all the bits become 1, then the ready signal is broadcast to all the processing elements so that they can proceed with the subsequent instruction streams. The lock-unlock type synchronization is also supported in the VPP500 system. The operating system for the VPP500 system 
is based on Unix System 5 Release 4 with a parallel extension to provide a parallel processing environment. As is shown in this diagram, the UXP slash VPP provides a single system image to the users, where users submit the job to the network queuing system, or NQS, on the global system processor. The control processor also runs the NQS and software called Partition Manager. The control processor takes the job from the global system processor, does a resource allocation depending on the available resources and also the job priority, and initiates the job execution. Each processing element also runs a kernel of Unix System 5 Release 4. The VPP500 system can be used both as a capability machine and as a capacity machine. Capability machine means that one job is parallelized across the processing elements for shorter execution time, while capacity machine means that the system can be utilized as a throughput machine where multiple jobs can be executed concurrently. In the case of a multi-job environment, many single processor jobs can run on processing elements according to the priority and the scheduling which is done by control processor while some of the processing elements can run parallel jobs. The control processors are connected to a system storage unit, which is a semiconductor memory device. There are two ways to utilize SSU for the read-write operations. One is to define files on SSU, that is called SVIO. This type of file is most effective when there are many small temporary files in the user's program. The second method is to use SSU as a cache to the files on disk drives. This method is called SSU cache and is very effective when the size of the file is large and also when there is a data locality. SSU cache is also suitable for sequential files. As described earlier, the VPP500 system can be viewed as a hierarchical memory computer system comprised of local memory on each processing element and the global data space which can be accessed by all the processors. For example, large-sized multidimensional arrays can be partitioned and stored in the global part of the memory. VPP Fortran is based on ANSI Fortran 77 together with the compiler directives for vectorization on one processing element and the compiler directives for parallel processing. Compiler directives provide a means for procedure decomposition and declaration of global arrays and data decomposition. There are also global functions such as summation, maximum minimum value search, and broadcast. Here's a sample code which has been parallelized using VPP Fortran. This short code depicts an explicit finite difference scheme for a time-dependent flow problem. In this parallelized version, some of the key compiler directives are highlighted. All the compiler directives start with exclamation XOCL. Here's the processor assignment. These are the global and local array declarations. This index partition ID, Q, describes how the global arrays are partitioned. In the main body of the program, the parallel region is specified, and inside the parallel region, spread do directives partition the do loops across the processors with a proper alignment of global data enforced by slash Q. Copying of the global data to and from local arrays can also be done explicitly by using the spread move directive. Spread move allows prefetching of data. It should be noted that Fortran 90 and High Performance Fortran, or HPF, will also be supported on VPP 500 system. Since each processing element of the VPP 500 system is a vector supercomputer by itself. Conversion of user programs is regarded as simple and straightforward. Starting with a vectorized Fortran 77 code, 
which can be executed on one processing element of VPP500, a further performance improvement can be made by parallelizing the already vectorized programs. We have some performance figures that we can discuss here. The first one is the performance of matrix multiplication on VPP500. This table shows the performance from 1 through 11 processors with matrix sizes around 2048 by 2048. The sustained performance, as is shown here, ranges from 1.58 to 16.8 gigaflops. The rightmost column shows the efficiency of the system, that is a ratio between the obtained gear flops value and the peak system performance. As is clear in this table, the efficiency of the system remains always above 95% from 1 to 11 processors, which means that the data communication time is almost completely overlapped with computation and does not significantly affect the performance. This table shows the performance of the linear equation solver by the LU decomposition as used in LIMPAC. The performance measurement is shown from 1 through 32 processors with various matrix sizes ranging from 1000 through 14720. And the performance ranges from 1.26 to 32.93 gigaflops. The third example is the performance of three-dimensional acoustic wave propagation solved with a finite difference scheme, which is similar to the example that I used in the beginning of this lecture, but more simplified scalar wave field only. The problem size is fixed, that is 251 by 251 by 251, and the performance was measured from one to eight processors. The megaflop values are shown here in this row, ranging from 800 megaflops all the way to 5.4 gigaflops. For this measurement, a very simple slab geometry was used in partitioning the data across the processors. I have described an approach in parallel supercomputing, vector parallel processing. Various merits of a system which incorporates fewer processing elements each with a vector processing capability have been discussed. These include the volume versus surface effect, less redundancy in code copies, and the vector software assets. And an actual working example, the VPP500 hardware and software have been described in detail. We can conclude that future supercomputers will depend on the combination of vector and parallel processing techniques. Thank you.